Senator and uh, Senator Halpern, if you would mind open us up in prayer, that's probably number four. Okay. Yes, let us bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us get together again today to do the good work for the people of this great state. Keep our minds open, allow us to receive the information, allow us to digest what we hear such that we may do good and honor you through our work. In thy name we pray, amen. Thanks, Senator Halpern. Uh, we have uh, three bills today, uh, House Bill 412, House Bill uh, 1069, and House Bill 1425. We are, uh, I wanted to make sure we started pretty close to on time because uh, we have uh, Dr. Michelle Zena uh, by Zoom, and she is literally in between patients uh, in her office, but she did clear her schedule on a late notice. I'm sure she didn't cancel any patients. I'm sure she just moved things around a little bit, and I uh, don't want to get anybody in trouble by any means. Uh, but uh, so uh, Chairman Dempsey was here a minute ago. She is still here. Uh, so that's, uh, I'm sorry. The, uh, so if you don't mind coming down, maybe right here, give us uh, uh, two minutes on your bill and then let's get uh, Dr. Zena. Uh, so I want to be uh, sensitive to her time, uh, if you don't mind. I don't mind if we need to let her go ahead and speak and then we could, you know, I know that's a different order, but if you would prefer understanding her schedule let me do two minutes okay so um we're bringing you today hb 412 and this is uh for the licensure of individuals in the practice of applied behavioral analysis the purpose of the bill is that currently there are no legal protections for georgia patients against those who might claim to practice aba professionally or to ensure those who do not meet established standards for education practical training and demonstrated knowledge of behavioral analysis. Additionally, no entity in the state exists to provide oversight of ABA practitioners or investigate allegations of wrongdoing. So therefore, consumers, employers, funders, and state agencies have no protection from individuals who make false claims to be qualified. It is currently in 33 states. Um, just to make sure that everyone understands behavioral analysis of the design, implementation, and evaluation of instructional and environmental modifications to produce socially significant improvements in human behavior. All right, that was actually less than one minute. Thank yeah. you very much. This this did go through uh, GORK. I want everybody to make sure that everybody's aware of that. Uh, so, because we're licensing something else. And uh, if anybody remembers three years ago, Four years ago, we passed legislation and several things got vetoed because they had not gone through GORC. This is one of those that has, and that's the purpose of that. And I did attend those. I didn't have a surrogate. That was me uh, listening in on those meetings because there were three different meetings, if I remember correctly. So but let's go to uh, Dr. Zena. Uh, Dr. Zena is a pediatrician down in the Statesboro area and does uh, behavior uh, mostly autism in South Georgia. And uh, Michelle Zena is well known to our committee uh, and has been an expert uh, witness and works with uh, the Department of Community Health and others in the care of this very needy um, uh, population and patients and uh, children. Um, Dr. Zena, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. Um, I am here to testify and support of House Bill 412. I diagnose about 10 cases of autism each week in my practice, and I recommend ABA therapy for many of these children. Um, licensure is going to help us ensure quality and reduce fraud. Um, ABA is the only financially significant service covered by Medicaid that doesn't have any state regulation through licensure, as far as I know. ABA therapy can cost as much as $500 a day. And for a child who needs intensive ABA therapy, Medicaid can pay $125,000 in a year for that one child's ABA therapy. And for us not to have uh, licensure as a tool to discourage fraud um, and ensure quality is a little concerning. 
Um, I have three board certified behavior analysts who work for me providing ABA therapy. And I ref the majority of the children that I refer to ABA therapy live too far from my office to even potentially get those services from my staff. Um, if there are any questions that y'all would like to ask me about the structure of how everything works or about autism in general or ABA therapy in general, I'm happy to assist. Uh, any questions? Looks like uh, we do not. Thank you uh, for being uh, testifying for us, Dr. Zena, and thank you for your efficiency. And uh, you can get back to seeing patients. Well, thank you so much. Only one got scheduled over to lunch. We did great. All righty, good deal. Thank you. Um, so, Representative Dempsey, would you like to uh, uh, put a time limit on you? Do you want? To, would you like for us to do testimony, or do you want to finish up and then you can, or you can, we can do testimony and then you, you can wrap it up testimony. at the end if you want to. You can do testimony. Whatever okay. I know, All everyone right. is running. I'm, pretty I'm fast easy today. And this is uh, today. this is not a packed room, and we don't have nine state patrolmen in here today, so I think we're good. And I will so, tell you too that we also. I, it is I a good have, day. I have an expert with me, Dr. Um, Colin Muthing. Um, he's the past president and um, is also a psychologist with Marcus Autism with the Emory facility. So if he yeah, no, that's great. He's number one on the on the list there. Okay. So if he you don't mind coming up to the witness stand or uh, I, I don't know what they uh, whatever the uh, witness uh, microphone there. So all right. Podium mic. How about that? Okay. Sounds good. I'll be brief. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Watson and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this important measure. My name is Colin Musing. I'm here on behalf of the Georgia Association of Behavior Analysis. I'm a past president and current advisor to the board, and I'm also the chair of the licensure committee for the past four years. I'm currently a doctoral level board certified behavior analyst, and I'm also a licensed psychologist in the state of Georgia. I want to start by giving a brief history of, of this very young profession. The behavior analysis certification board, the certifying entity was created in 1998, and the first board certification was given that same year. Since then, um, since that creation of the board, the field has grown exponentially. To give you an idea, nationally in 1999, there were 28 board certified behavior analysts. 10 years later, 2009, 5,700. 10 years later, 37,800. And as of 2021, there are almost 55,000 board certified behavior analysts nationally. This speaks to that rapid growth in just 20 years. Those are not the only people that practice behavior analysis. There are also technicians that were newly created in 2014 by the Behavior Analysis Certification Board. At that time, there were 328 registered technicians. As of 2021, there are over 112,000 registered technicians nationally. In the year 2009, Nevada and Oklahoma passed the first state licensure laws for behavior analysts. Since then, including a new state, Wyoming, just uh, two weeks ago, 34 states now have licensure. You may recall about seven years ago in 2015, Senator Tommy Williams carried a bill for Medicaid coverage for ABA called Avis Law. This was done to expand coverage and access um, to this important and vital service. Since then, the number of behavior analysts in Georgia itself has also grown exponentially. In 2016, there were 365 certified behavior analysts. The most recent data from 2021 indicate there are more than 1,000 behavior analysts in the state and currently around 4,000 registered technicians. HB 412 is presented because of the growth of the profession that is currently not regulated by, with, by any entity within the state. Let me quickly walk you, walk you through the bill and then I'll wrap up. Section one uh, goes over definitions. Um, then we go over the composition of the board, lines 53 through 100. Lines 101 through 166 outline the board authorities. Lines 118 to 152 outline the requirements necessary to become a licensed behavior analyst. The next section, lines 154 to 159, 159 discuss violations of this bill. 161 to 222 outline numerous exemptions, um, and the remainder of the bill outlines temporary licensure and licensure renewal. With that, I'll open it up if there are any questions. All right, seeing none, thank you so, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Al looks probably 11, 10, 10. Hi. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. So just to be clear, does that mean uh, with the passage of this bill that everyone who practices behavioral analysis would need 
to have an individual license in order to practice ABA therapy? Correct. Okay. Those 1,000 board certified behavior analysts would need to, unless they meet the exemptions that are outlined in those and at the end of the bill. Got it. All right. Seeing no, uh, Senator Ulrich, number eight. Thank you. Uh, you run at warp speed going through that. So Trying to just be respectful of time. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and I know uh, families across the state are looking closely at uh, what we do up here because we we're on a journey. And, and I was here when we did Abel's Law. Uh, so this essentially ensures that we've got uh, a, a process that vets and holds to a high standard, the people that are providing these services in this relatively new uh, field. Correct, yes, they'd have to meet all the requirements for obtaining a license. And then we could also, you know, uh, evaluate violations of, um, you know, the, the ethical code or things like that within the state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? So I, I see none. All righty. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and so we have Anna um, Ballard. I may have mispronounced that. Um, Ms. Ballard, Bullard, I'm sorry. It's Bullard, yeah, that's Bullard. okay. If you just uh, identify yourself and if you're with the group, uh, uh, let us know and uh, the yeah. podium is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Anna Bullard. I'm Ava's mom um, from Ava's Law and uh, I'm, I'm here in favor of the bill um, and I you know as many of you know and I, I have to say obviously as always thank you so much to everyone um, on this committee who was a part of helping us pass coverage um, for Medicaid and for those with insurance in our state, it has impacted our families in a huge way. Um, but I will say, Ava, as you know, received ABA um, early on as a nonverbal child with autism who couldn't say mama at age four. Um, and, you know, she received very high quality ABA. It was, it changed her life. And, and today, um, I, I think it was two days ago, I should know, um, and I don't know why I'm nervous. I've done this too many times, but but she was accepted into UGA. Oh my goodness! Wow. And she's yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's such a testament. Now she's going into the astronomy program, which is like zero point one percent of students. And so I'm like, you'll have a really small classroom, um, but it it the impact was because of the quality of the service and um you know i think that this bill is important um i've expressed you know uh to representative dempsey you know we we're looking at making sure it doesn't cause any access issues right that was my main concern just not wanting this licensure to delay services and she is um, working to address those um, and so i feel really good about that I, i'm you know and i just really want every kid in the state of georgia to receive the kind of service ava did so i think this is important i'm working now with the behavioral health center of excellence which is an accreditation body on the same issue right and so it does make a difference there are different um, quality of services within ABA. Um, so I, I would, um, you know, would love all of you to support the passage of this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for being here. And I uh, apologize for not pronouncing your name correctly, but all of us here who've been here with uh, for Ava, and uh, that certainly is fabulous news, uh, I'm sure, for her and I'm sure for the family, too, for that matter. Go dogs. Uh, uh, so uh, we uh, we have, uh, I think, two or three more people on uh, Zoom also. I didn't mean to skip you. Um, so okay so Jeannie Weldon uh if we could uh, and I don't care which order uh Crystal Anderson also Tabitha Burkhart uh Wilson's also there um Andrew you want to just tee us up um Jenna Weldon's first on the list good afternoon 
Thank you so much for providing me this opportunity to speak. But um, what I want you to know, I am the mother of a 13-year-old autistic son. And what's important that you all know is that it's actually my son that encouraged me to speak with the committee um, when he heard about HB 412. His exact words to me were, Mom, you have to speak to that committee. It's a scam that ABA providers could provide services without proper education and training. And yes, that's just who my son is. <laughs> Um, when my son received his autism diagnosis at age, age nine, ABA was one of many therapies that was suggested. He's had many different doctors and therapists over the years, yet those that provide him ABA are the only ones who are not licensed by the state. As a former educator of 24 years and a mother, I can't imagine having my children in a school without certified teachers. Yet, so many children, my own included, spend as much time, if not more, in ABA than, than they do in school, and they're with providers that don't have any oversight. My son's ABA clinic in Sandy Springs is the only place outside of our home for which my son feels seen and understood. We're blessed that he's been working with the same certified, board certified behavior analyst for two years. We've seen more growth in his communication skills, social skills, and emotional regulation because of his ABA therapy than we have from his working with any other doctor or therapist. While our experiences with ABA have been nothing short of fantastic, we know it's not the case for everyone because not everyone who's providing ABA has the same education and training. The other part of this is that as a mother, it's not just about proper education training, but it's also about the safety of our children. My child is clearly verbal, but there are a lot of autistic children who are nonverbal. If a nonverbal child is being harmed, that child is not able to tell anyone what happened. Autistic children are not only minors, but they're vulnerable individuals as well due to their disability. The oversight of adults working with these children becomes, in this case, even more important. And while one background check is not necessarily a fail safe, it is in conjunction with other measures, one more way to help protect our children. I know that I'm only one parent, but I know I speak for many in support of HB 12. And I'd like to thank you so much for providing me this opportunity to speak today. Thank, thank you, Ms. Weldon. Um, any questions? We're good. Thank you so much. And uh, tell your son, we appreciate him getting his mother to, uh, to testify. Will uh, do. Okay. Uh, why don't we go ahead? Uh, let's get Tom Bauer up here, if you don't mind, uh, up to the podium. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, did you get that handout passed out already? I was going to walk them through it. Okay. Uh, okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm Tom Bauer with the Georgia Occupational Therapy uh, Association, and uh, I want to be clear that we support the licensure of the ABA profession and the prof and the. Uh, analysts and the assistants. Uh, we testified to Gork, as you know, Mr. Chairman, you were on there, as did uh, the psychologists and the speech therapists. And we have some concerns, uh, some minor concerns about the scope of practice. But what I really want to focus in on is the registered behavior technicians that uh, you've heard testified about. We couldn't agree more that this profession needs regulating. Uh, what bothers us a good bit is that the technicians, unlike other professionals or other actors in other professions, are way less trained than, say, an occupational therapy assistant, uh, and they're not really very much, there's no ratio in terms of supervision by the analysts, how many they can do at one time. Uh, I'm glad the Representative Chairman Dempsey uh, mentioned the fact that there's no place in Georgia to go if there is a problem. Uh, and this board is not like the other boards that we will have in Georgia because they're going to license the assistant, the analysts and the assistants, but the technicians are not even going to be known to the board. Uh, they're not identified. We've, we've asked them to consider that at least. Uh, uh, one of the responses was that that would put a chilling effect on, uh, and we're not trying to de delay services to kids at all, but I don't know how if you just required the analysts to tell the board whom they're supervising and whom they're, whom they're employing, how that's going to, to you know, chill access to care. Um, the, um, 
uh, the, the technicians provide most of the care to these folks. Uh, we got data from the Department of Community Health on their autism benefit. And for the two most uh, used direct treatment codes, 70, 73% of the treatment was by the technicians. So like the lady who spoke before me, we, we want her to know that her, her child is getting quality care and we want her to know if there's a place for the technicians if there's a problem that there's a place to go in georgia to uh complain uh as far as i can tell there's nothing in this board that that would allow them to regulate uh and discipline technicians so we would we would ask you to pause and let us work with uh, folks and we've offered a couple of amendments and uh, would like to have the opportunity to discuss them um, uh, and finally uh, we did offer some minor amendments to the scope of practice of the behavior uh, analysts which is rather broad and so as is done in many other licensure laws we had asked that it just expressly say that um, behavior analysis does not include the practice of occupational therapy, psychology, uh, uh, licensed counseling, or clinical social work. Um, I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions. That's, uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Okay. Any questions from the committee? All right. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. I'm sorry. Senator Halpern. Question about the technicians. Um, yes, ma'am. So, so my I have a son who this summer we actually did a program through the Market Center, and it was a feeding kind of a program, multidisciplinary feeding program, because he's an extraordinarily picky eater. In any case, um, it was an outpatient program, but it was every day. And so every day we would go and there would be a person who would work with him and kind of oversee him who also had super supervisors looking at the work she was doing. Mm -hmm. And she was a young woman, had just graduated college, had this as a career interest, but she was going to go on to graduate school. And I believe she really fits that definition of technician. I suppose my question is, are the technicians aren't the te technicians being overseen by people who actually have been in the practice for more time? And are the technicians um, a little bit more tra trans transitory in, okay. in their practice? This because yes, they haven't decided that this is what they're going to do for a career. Thank you for that question, because in my haste, I didn't cover one of the points I wanted to. But uh, first of all, we have less concern about the child who's going to the clinic. Uh, there are many, many kids who are being seen at home as much as 30, 40 hours a week where they're not overseen at the clinic and the supervisory requirements. And again, you have to really go to a national certifying body and do a Google to find that out. Those requirements are such that, uh, there's very little face-to-face -face contact with the analyst who's supervising them, uh, because and in fact, the analyst may have as many as uh, 10 people working for him at one time. Uh, and so these folks could be in the home, the technicians, and nobody's on site. And so that was one of our concerns. But you did bring up one of my major concerns is that it's not always at the clinic setting, it's in the home. And as to the training of the technician, uh, if, if the technician that your daughter was seeing is had a college degree, that's a lot more than is required right now, because what's required for the technician now is just a 40 hour online course course, which doesn't really uh, a high school degree, a 40 hour online course with uh, no no patient contact, I don't think so. By comparison, an occupational therapy assistant is a two year associate who has a year a year of that as an internship seeing patients. So thank you for that question. And, and those are the kinds of things we just want the reasons we would like the technicians to be identified to the board. So uh, as as Gork, I uh, did not mention, um, the Gork did recommend licensure, but it also asked the applicant group, that's the analyst, to work with the legislature on supervising, supervision and accountability of technicians. Uh, Gork had some of the same concerns we did. And really, I don't think those concerns have been addressed 
in in, in legislation since Gork's seen it. There have been two two minor places where it says that the technician works under the, the, the analyst is responsible for the technician, but I really don't think that's a whole lot of accountability, especially when the board here in Georgia doesn't know who they are and there's no way for the public to complain to a board here. Thank you for that question. Chairman Dempsey, thank you. Tom, any more questions? I want to get Chairman Dempsey just to respond. Thank you, sure. Mr. Bauer. I may need Dr. Musing too, as an expert in understanding this, if possible, if he wants to sit here, I'll start. And then if, if there's some questions, he may be able to help with that. And Senator Halpern, that's exactly what I've witnessed actually at Marcus too, a young and a while ago, but a young child who um, was not eating at all, basically. And it was that an overriding, I mean, it's a, it's a constant positive situation of trying to introduce those tastes and get them to do that as a, just as an observer, I was fascinated by some of the work they were doing. So I hope you met with that great success too. So we did, there are five places actually where we did address the Gort um, suggestions. If you want to look, first of all, specifically for the one that Mr. Bauer was talking about on lines 25 is where that begins. And that's in the definition of the behavior technician, uh, very specifically there, it means a paraprofessional who practices under the extended authority, close and ongoing supervision and responsibility of a licensed behavior analyst or licensed assistant behavioral analyst and delivers services by such licensee, but does not design assessment or intervention plans or procedures. So that is that close watchful oversight. Then again, on line 168, it also addresses that. Um, a behavior technician who delivers applied behavioral analyst services under the extended authority, close and ongoing supervision and responsibility. That same language is in there again of a licensed assistant behavioral analyst. As you said, particularly in this, and, and I believe Mr. Bauer is talking about a ther an occupational therapy assistant. We are talking not about an assistant, but a technician who is carrying out the hours sometimes of exacting service delivery to patiently bring that client through to a better place. So we did address it right there, according to the recommendation. Um, that is one of the first, if you want me to go on, or if you want to no, just I mean, do I think that that's, one uh, right now. No, I think that's, okay. uh, that's good. We're clear on that. Was the, there was one other issue that he had raised. So well, there are, to to? Um, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Um, it was comparing sort of two different types of, of work, though, actually an assistant versus this therapist person who was. Um, Dr. Meeting, do you have anything to add or? Uh, yes, two things. Can um, you get that mic closer, closer sorry. to you? Yes, if you look at line 246 and 247, um, we have added in um, that there will be a link to the certifying entity. So the Behavior Analysis Certification Board will be on our licensing board's webpage. This link will be to the registry of all technicians that can then be filtered by the state. So there is a way of identifying the technicians okay. and who they fall under. On that website, what is listed is the technician, when they were certified, and who is their supervisor, who is the board certified behavior analyst that is responsible for their code of conduct. Additionally, I'd like to add one more thing. There is an experience requirement for technicians to go into and, and work with children. It is a 40 hour course, but then there is a checklist that a board certified behavior analyst then has to check them off that they are able to exhibit the skills necessary of a technician before they can work with the population. So there is an experience requirement before they are allowed to, to provide the services. All right. Any other questions, Dr. Al? If, if I could also say to that, many are in school or finishing school and might go on further to bog them down in a licensing procedure at this point, might keep them stuck in that place. They're often experiencing this and see if they want to consider this as a more extended career. Gotcha. We need them. Dr. Al. Badly. I want to go back. Thank you. I want to go back to the uh, issue of the uh, supervisory ratio that I believe the gentleman brought up before. Mm -hmm in terms of having actual close supervision. Is, is there language in the bill about a supervisory ratio in order to in, ensure that the supervision is 
there is no language about like a ratio or anything like that. What is in the bill is that like, you know, the, the supervisor is responsible for the conduct of their supervisee. So we have to abide by the ethical code and there are supervision requirements listed with the national certification board. What they are is that there has to be at least two in-person contacts with the person 5% of their total hours. So if you're talking about in a month, I have to supervise my technicians eight hours in a month. Um, they, I also have to meet with them individually face to face and I have to observe them conducting therapy with their patient every single month. So there is a requirement and we are audited by the national board and things like that. So there is a, a pretty heavy supervision requirement. When you're talking about when you have eight technicians, that's 36 hours. A, wait, that's terrible math, 64 hours a month. Sorry, it's horrible math. I'm not okay, a mathematician. He's a psychologist, <laughs> yes, exactly. not a mathematician. I get you, okay, <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, we have some more to testify, but we're getting a little bit short on time. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, can I, what I'd like to do, and I apologize to the folks on Zoom, what we're going to do is we're going, uh, let's, let's get you uh, your testimony. And if, if, if we could be cognizant of the time, uh, we'd much appreciate that. Uh, Crystal Anderson, is Andrew, got you yes, I there? Here. Thank you. Yes, and um, I go by Stubbs now, but I am the same person you're expecting. <laughs> um, thank you, Chairman Watson and members of the committee. Um, I appreciate the time for uh, to be able to speak about my son, Grayson. Um, Grayson was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder in July of 2016, shortly before his third birthday, after it became apparent to us, as well as his pediatrician, that he wasn't hitting his developmental milestones. Having had three children previously, we understood that children develop in their own time, but it was obvious that Grayson was progressing a, a lot differently than his siblings had, especially in how he communicated. At the time of his diagnosis, Grayson was essentially nonverbal. His only real method of communicating was by him grabbing my hand and using my fingers to point at what he wanted. He seemed terrified by the most random things, pine cones, a talking Elmo book, a picture of a robot, and any loud noise, flashing lights, or even car rides would send him into a meltdown that would last hours. We would give him prompts to do the simplest things, like picking up a toy, that seemed to confuse him. He spent days at Children's on two occasions because he couldn't communicate to us that he felt sick and show no external signs of there being anything wrong. But we came very close to losing him because we didn't know anything was wrong. Being unable to communicate with your own child is beyond heartbreaking in good times, but devastating when they're hurt or ill. When we received the referral for ABA therapy, I was completely overwhelmed. I had no idea what ABA was or how I was gonna manage this prescribed course of treatment for my child while also balancing a, a demanding full-time job, three other children, um, who had needs of their own. After doing a lot of research into the limited options that were available inside the perimeter where we lived, I came across a clinic that accepted our insurance and provided an option for necessary um, in-home therapy. Kyle Skates, the board certified behavioral analyst who was assigned to us, patiently walked us through the intake process, screen grace and determine to determine his therapy regimen and told us that although she was the one who would be developing the plan of action for Grayson's therapy, there would be another technician that would be working directly with him the three days a week, but she would also be supervising. I trusted Kyle implicitly based on our discussions and her credentials. Miss Emily was Grayson's first technician. Over the course of a year and with check-ins and treatment updates with Miss Kyle, Grayson began to learn to find his words. In what seemed like record time, Grayson was beginning to speak. He started with stringing together two and three words and quickly began using his words to know how he was feeling and what he needed, something I worried he would be never be able to do. Miss Emily taught him about emotions and how to regulate them. When Grayson was five, his therapy team had a celebration when he finally used the potty on his own. Over the years, they taught him how to use pronouns, ride a bike, and scope, uh, coping strategies to work through his uncomfortable and scary moments. Today, Grayson is a thriving second grader who is well known by his entire school as being an incredibly kind and hilarious kid who never shuts up. 
um, <laughs> with an unusual knowledge of Godzilla and our universe. And although he still has significant challenges, he is on the principal's honor roll, takes piano lessons, and is learning Hebrew, something the rest of us still can't figure out. <laughs> on a recent conference call with his teacher, she told me he's the strongest reader in his class and enjoys sharing his knowledge with his classmates so much that she asked him to lead a small uh, classroom reading group once a week, and he loves it. Where once he was a loner who could who would actively avoid interacting with his peers, he's become quite the social butterfly with a vocabulary that puts some adults to shame. As a vocal advocate for the autistic community, I'm often engaged in conversations with parents and others who question the efficacy of ABA therapy, and I've shared Grayson's story as a testament to how life-changing it has been for him and for our family. I have no doubts that by having this team of amazing, consistent technicians led by a qualified and board-certified behavioral analyst, was our was the blessing our family needed to support our child through his most difficult years they provided our entire family hope that grayson would not only be changed would not be changed but would be guided toward finding his own voice i would re be remiss if i didn't mention that not only did bcba our bcba help grayson find his voice in how to communicate um, but it also taught us through our monthly parenting sessions um, how to better understand and communicate with him as well, um, all of which was incredibly invaluable. Thank you so Parents, much. Parents. Uh, Ms. Uh, Anderson, we, we appreciate that. That is a wonderful testimony. We're certainly very happy uh, about your son. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Tabitha Burkhart Wilson. Uh, with Kentucky DBHDD, am I right on that? Yes, and uh, Ken, we'll give you we'll give you uh, a minute since you're out of state. You don't vote for any of us, so uh, we're uh, so <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, we we have two other bills we have to do. And we got 20 minutes to do it, so you got a minute. Sure, I won't even take your minute. So yes, I'm Tabitha Burkhart Wilson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Spring Health, Behavioral Health and Integrated Care, uh, former employee of the Kentucky Department of Behavioral Health, a previous director. And so in, a, in an effort to just save time, I'm just here to say I'm in support of the bill. Uh, we are a behavioral health provider throughout the state of Georgia. We're in support of the bill and I'm here to answer any questions if anyone has any on the exceptions, the exemptions that are part of the bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, are you in Georgia now? Yes. Yeah, so we actually. Oh, well, are... you know, the 30 seconds then. How about that? <laughs> I'm just joking. No, we're yeah. good. Okay. All right. Yeah, Thank you so much. All right. So Jamila, <laughs> Jamila Pope or Pape? Uh, yes. And you are, this is Choa, Marcus Autism. You are in favor. Okay. Marcus Autism Center, we are in full support of this bill. Um, the only thing I will add is we do employ and provide training to BCBA professionals at Marcus. We have approximately 40 employees. We probably have 15 um, at any given time training within our walls, and we probably train somewhere um, in some capacity uh, more than 200 per year. We believe this would help ensure these professionals that are practicing in our state are properly credentialed and receive the necessary continuing education credits, and that would help ensure the quality of the treatment that are being provided to the children. We also have a joint master's BCBA program with the University of Georgia. So these professionals are getting taught at Marcus Autism Center or through telelearning. And we act as a uh, type of um, satellite campus for UGA on this. Thanks so much. And I think that uh, uh, ends testimony. I'll be happy to entertain a motion. Uh, got a Senator Halpern do pass, have a second. Um, Senator Orock, thank you so much. Uh, any further discussion? I don't see any. We had to have some further discussions. Senator uh, uh, Dolezal, one, is that right? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to point out two things uh, for the committee. One, um, I, I've got concern. Um, Ava's mom mentioned the, the, the access to care seemingly in lines 152 to 153 immediately outlaw care being given upon enactment of this law. So I don't know how the thorough put of the, of the board is going to work to license a thousand or even a hundred members and what the members don't do while they're awaiting licensure. That's one concern that I have. Let me be clear, 152. I'm sorry, I think I said one. Uh, you know, you're in the pink, so that's, we're in a substitute. I should have pointed that out. LC 339119S is a substitute. So I'm sure it exists in the same, yes, yeah, I, 155, I 156. Okay, 155, 156. Okay. So that's um, one concern I have. And then Mr. Chairman, the second concern that I have is lines 80 and 81. I'm not sure how standard it is for us. There's, there's a lot of, um, in this call out for diversity here, there's a lot of diversity boxes for us to check. For one, I don't know how you define economic diversity, um, geographic diversity, and under the racial diversity, I think about, you know, the state's less than 5% Asian. Uh, less than 10% Hispanic. You know, if you have an amendment and you want to make a change. I would, Mr. Chairman, I would move that we strike lines 80 through 81. 80 through 81. Was that what you said? Okay. So you would just take out that definition and then change the other letters. Okay. Uh, so we got a motion. So I think that's the appropriate stance. Let's see, let me turn to my research and analysts. We're in a discussion portion. Yeah. So we've already had a motion discussion. So we have a motion on the on the floor or here in the committee uh, to strike lines 80, 81. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All righty, any further discussion on this amendment? Uh, Senator Dolezal? I would just add, Mr. Chairman, I think that under this, I, I think that it's impossible to achieve success of this metric. For example, I believe um, that if you were to reflect, for example, the gender diversity of the state, but you had a member, a, a board of five people that was four females, um, it could be argued that that did not um, match the gender diversity. If you had a board member that was one Asian, one Hispanic, one African American, two. All right, we got you. Et cetera. Any, any so. other discussion, question? All right, Senator Halpern and four. So four. I wonder if the intention of those lines isn't to be quite as prescriptive as you're saying, where there's 33% African American in the state, so 30%, 3% of the board has to, but is more generally intending to say, let's make sure that the licensing board has a broad swath of people who we do see in our state, as opposed to say all just white people or white men, or, and, and especially the geographic piece too, that we're not just prioritizing urban versus rural, so I, I wonder if the intention is more broadly saying, let's make sure that we're not forgetting that we've got a lot of different people in the state who all are gonna have to take use of the services that we're talking about here and the board should reflect that. All right. I worry about striking those lines entirely, but I'm not quite sure how I, to- I understand, uh, Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I share Senator Dolezal's concerns as, as well, and I appreciate Senator Halpern raising the point she's raising. I think it's a fair point, but I think from a legal construction, my concern is that the language shall reflect, which is on line 80, is going to drive someone to be able to challenge an appointment that says the legislature said the membership shall reflect. Gotcha. It's, it's okay. not aspirational. And my second point is, I think this type of language unfairly and inappropriately intrudes on, in this case, the governor's discretion, whomever that may be at the time, to make the appointments as we have set out. Gotcha. Any further discussion? Let's go ahead and vote on this if we can. Uh, so uh, all those in favor of the Dolezal Amendment striking lines 8081 on LC 339119S, uh, raise your hand. All right, that's five. All those against? Four. It, it 
will be struck. So the amendment uh, to strike those lines passes. All right, so any further discussion? Um, well, can I maybe follow up, please? On the point you just made, shall, what is the other language that we usually use that can at least say that we would like to see? It, I mean, you can do may, but I think that's probably going, uh, oh, yeah. um, that's usually the language on that. So we'll vote on that too, if you want to, All right? Number 10, 11. Well, I don't know. What did I suggest? May? Okay, may. Yeah, I agree. I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree that shall is really the crux of the problem. I yeah. do like prioritizing having a, a board that reflects the state. C can we change it to something like shall endeavor? Or, sorry, it's, should, you know, should endeavor to you or something like that? It's your option. We're in the discussion portion. If you want to do an amendment that, that says the membership of the board may reflect the racial, gender, geographic, urban, should slash, rural, and economic to. diversity should of the endeavor state. Endeavor to. Because it's aspirational. As we, as we as the board should endeavor. Should endeavor to. Uh, okay. Like the racial gender. All right. Do I have a second? A second. All right. So, any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, let me make sure we're putting the right words in here. So Betsy has it, and Jocelyn has it. The membership of the board should endeavor to reflect the racial, gender, geographic, urban, slash, rural, and economic diversity of the state. Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah. No it's, not. What is it? no, it's not shall, it should, should endeavor. Any further discussion here? Just one, I think to Senator Dole's all his concerns. I don't know how you meet the metrics of this. I, I understand, I think we're gonna vote it and okay. we'll see. All right, sure. so all those in favor of the amendment, uh, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, it's four. And all those against? Five. Okay. It, the amendment goes down. Any further discussion? We'll vote on the bill if not. All right. So all those in favor of LC 339119S as amended. Is that right? Is that correct? As amended. Uh, so uh, raise your hand. It was, yeah, 9119S, meaning a substitute as amended. As amended. All those in favor, raise your hand. Well, that's unanimous. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Chairman Dempsey. Yeah, and um, two things, if I could. Senator Brass, I believe, is going to be. And he's he is this. back here to your right. We, I, I do it's want y'all to be aware of one thing too, as you step away from from what you've just committed to, that is so important. Um, we had discussions, uh, speakers uh, reflecting autism, the work in autism. That is not the only place where this is really well served. So geriatric, traumatic brain injury, developmental disabilities, um, substance abuse, behavior right. disorders. You, you had us at hello. In a Thank lot you. Of, All righty. Thank you. All right. Next, we're, uh, we appreciate your work on this. Thank you so much. And Senator Brass is going to be carrying it for us. So, uh, all right. So we have uh, next, Ch Chairman Bruce Williamson is on the floor here in committee, House Bill 1069, Adult Residential Mental Health Services Listening Licensing Act, I'm sorry, Licensing Act. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I bring before you House Bill 1069. It's LC 339088S. And quite simply, this creates, it does create a new licensure. I call it an aberration of the fact that there's not already a category for adult residential psychiatric treatment centers. These are not hospitals. Um, they're patients, so they're uh, uh, I guess the word would be patients are there voluntarily, so it's not a psychiatric hospital. Uh, but currently, adult residential psychiatric treatment centers are sort of forced and pigeonholed as personal care homes by the Department of Community Health. And as all of us know, personal care homes uh, typically meet the needs of, of the po folks that are typically older in life, uh, that have mobility or cognitive issues. And unlike that class of citizens have been served by personal care homes, adult psychiatric uh, residential treatment centers are, are, uh, are, 
it's part of their therapy to be able to uh, give counseling to people on the foods they eat, the packages they may, uh, may or may not receive. Um, importantly, uh, the, the need to be able to administer medicines, none of which you can do under a personal care home license. They are offered, most of these uh, centers, there's only five or six of them operating in the state, are having to do so through waivers from the Department of Community Health. Uh, and this, so this measure creates a new licensure category that specifically addresses the needs for adult residential psychiatric treatment centers. And importantly, the, many of these centers are uh, accepting uh, or are, are being approved for private insurance, but some insurance companies resist and push back when they say, what's your licensure? And, and they say, well, it's personal care home. So it gives an opportunity for coverage that would have otherwise been there absent the correct licensing nomenclature uh, to, to fall, in, fall in, in, into place and, and, and patients uh, get access to health care for which they've already paid a premium. Um, happy to answer any questions. I do have a couple of experts, of, uh, both the attorney that's uh, familiar with the uh, exactly how the bill is worded. And also uh, uh, Beth Finnerty is executive director of uh, Skyland Trail, which is a, a well-known 30 year old uh, treatment center here in, uh, in Atlanta. That's uh, got a worldwide reputation for doing great work there as well as Dr. I can't pronounce his last name. So I call him Dr. K, uh, who's a psychiatrist. All of them would be happy to answer any technical questions that this author may not be able to answer. Do we have any questions at all? So basically this is licensed as a personal care home. This will allow them to uh, do a little bit more from that perspective and give them a, a carve out uh, for this particular area of expertise relating to mental health services. That, that is correct. The uh, specifically, if you think about it, a lot of young, Skyland Trail is the one with whom I'm most familiar, but they address a lot of needs of younger patients, 18 to 30 years old. And you can imagine that a, a young person might have a severe uh, eating disorder, a mental illness, and you really wouldn't want them to be uh, buying their own food. What you can do is, you know, personal care home is in fact your home. It just happens to be an apartment-like setting. So other things like they can help control package delivery. You might have obsessive compulsive. I, don't, I do not have a medical back, background. Thank but, you. It, so uh, everybody. All these other uh, conditions that this licensure would allow them without having to go through the waiver process. Thank you. So time. Skyland Trail, uh, Beth Energy and Ray, Dr. Ray, Dr. K, Dr. K uh, and Stan Jones all in favor. There's nobody uh, that was opposed. Uh, are there any questions? You're, you're reading my mind. Thank you so much. Ready for a motion? Let's do a motion. Motion to that, do, that, do, that do, pass. do pass. What's that? No, we're going to do a motion and then we'll do discussion if we got anything further. Motion. Yeah, to do pass House Bill 1069 LC 33988S. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion. Yeah, I just want to be clear because um, we addressed recovery residences last year in the law and they're, they're not regulated by BCH because they don't provide any treatment. But I was listening to you speak about things like food and packages and whatever. I just want to be sure that we're talking about facilities that are actually providing treatment. That is correct. If you read the, the bill outlines each one of the mandated services and uh, the, they, uh, and the ability for the Department of Community to help to make sure those services are being provided. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Any further discussion? We did pass the House of, of, with only one uh, nay vote. All those in favor, uh, raise your hand. Uh, okay, you got to vote or step out. There we go. All righty. Thanks. That's unanimous. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Kirkpatrick. So, excuse me. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Senator Kennedy's uh, graciously agreed to carry. Okay, the great. Thank provided. you so much. Thank Appreciate that. Senator Workhauser. 
you are not your last but not least. And uh, so what we have is a in your we have a substitute that's come and it is the same bill that is passed out of the Senate. So uh, we're going to substitute our bill into your bill. Okay. And that's what we're going to pass here today. We've already passed it here today. And we're not going to take any testimony. And that's okay. going to be the, the, the position of the Senate is that we want the commission to do their dang job. Okay. by may 31st if i remember does that correctly. mean immediately take the existing bids and have them scored through no DS? that means okay. no that means do your job okay all right and that that's the message we're sending do your job and that's where we are that's the senate's position and uh now i think there may be uh is it is scribner's era the appropriate way to say that yeah Okay. Okay. Could I get a copy of that bill? Uh, no. Okay. So we'll we'll get it to you. I'm, okay. I'm just joking. So that's that's the position of the Senate. And that's that's where we are. And uh, so uh, I'm happy to uh, take a motion on that. I'll be carrying it on the floor. I have a motion. Got got a motion. Got a got a second. All those in favor, uh, let's raise your hand. All those in favor, and that's unanimous. All right. Thank you. Appreciate okay, it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Meeting is adjourned.